My name is Michael Watson, Head of History Publishing at Cambridge University Press, and I'm very pleased to introduce our two panellists, Lucas Engelman and Jack Pepin. Lucas is Chancellor's Fellow and Senior Lecturer in History and Sociology of Biomedicine in the Department of Science, Technology and Innovation Studies at the University of Edinburgh. As I mentioned a moment ago, Lucas is the author of Mapping AIDS, Visual Histories of an, an Enduring Epidemic, which is a groundbreaking account of the part played by photographs, maps, and viral models in the establishment of AIDS as a medical phenomenon. The book was originally published in late 2018, and it's just been released in a paperback edition. Our second panelist is Jacques Pepin, who is an infectious diseases physician and epidemiologist based at the University of Sherbrooke. He began his career by working in a bush hospital in Zaire in a sleeping sickness epidemic area before later conducting research on HIV-2 in the Gambia and managing interventions targeting sex workers in Ghana and Togo. He brought these diverse experiences together with a bit of colonial history to set out um, a new account of the events that led to the emergence of AIDS in his acclaimed 2011 book, The Origins of AIDS, which is just about to be published in a completely revised and updated edition. Now, thank you both for joining us. Um, now, it seems logical to begin um, with the origins of AIDS, and so I'd like to get underway with a question for Jacques. Um, it's believed that AIDS first emerged in Cameroon in the early decades of the 20th century. Um, Jacques, could you summarise for us what was going on in that part of Africa at the time, and what you believe is the most likely route of transmission of the virus, and why the AIDS epidemic took off in Leopoldville rather than in Cameroon? Okay, well, thank you for the uh, introduction. So, Basically, we, we know for sure that the, the source of HIV-1 is the, um, the, the chimpanzee of Central Africa. So a, a chimpanzee that lives in Cameroon, the, the Congo, Gabon, and, and, and so on. We know also for sure that the initial case, the, the, the mythical patient zero, the first human being infected, we know that this happened in the southeastern part of, of uh, Cameroon, near or around a town called Mulundu. Uh, now, th that, now there's, there's been for a long time what some people have called the Cameroonian paradox. What, this paradox is, is, is as follows. So we are sure that the first infection occurred there. But then the virus completely disappeared from the, from the country, from Cameroon, for about 50 to 60 years until it was re-exported from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So that's, that's quite strange. Now, we also know, know for sure that the, the real tinderbox in the development of the pandemic was Leopoldville. Leopoldville, it's now known as Kinshasa, it was then the capital of the Belgian Congo. And that's where the pandemic really started. And that's also certain. There's no discussion anymore about that. Um, now, the, we know that the virus arrived in Leopoldville uh, around 1920, give or take 10 years. So let's say between 1910 and 1930. And from there, it slowly, it slowly spread. And eventually, out of Leopoldville, other African countries, well, other parts of the Congo were infected, other African countries as, as well, and eventually uh, the rest of the world. So th this is where it all happened. Now, the question is, how, how did it get there from Southeast Cameroon to, uh, to the capital of the what was then the Belgian Congo? And wh what, wh what I explain in the... Uh, in this second edition of the book on the origins of AIDS, is that this might be related actually to uh, to World War One. So what happened is that the uh, the British, the French, and the Belgians, uh, at the outset of World War One, decided to invade all German colonies, which were easy targets for them. So one of these colonies was Cameroon, and so the Allied forces sent. Uh, soldiers from five different directions. But the one that's interesting for us is a force that they sent to invade the southeastern part of Cameroon. Uh, 
So basically, uh, about 1,600 soldiers, maybe 600 from the Belgian Congo and 1,000 from the, the French Congo. In addition, uh, 100 European officers. They were sent up the River Congo and then up a, tribut a tributary called the Sangha River. And they got actually to this place, Mulundu. Uh, so they got there at the end of 1914. They spent several months in Mulundu, and eventually they proceeded further uh, and, and eventually reached uh, Yaoundé, which was then the capital of the German colony. And, and, and eventually that was the, the, final, uh, the final battle. And after that, at the, en at the end of the, of the war in Cameroon, they were repatriated by sea towards uh, the port of Matadi in the Belgian Congo and from there to Leopoldville. And so, event so they eventually arrived in Leopoldville in, uh, in, uh, in the middle of 1916. Now, wh while in Mulundu, the main challenge was not the enemy's bullets, the main challenge was starvation. Food had, sorry, food had to be supplied from Brazzaville, which was a long way from, uh, from Mulundu. And they really had a hard time with uh, with food supplies, so they, they basically that that was the only option they had to live off, live off the land, and that included hunting. So soldiers were sent into the forest every day with rifles and a lot of ammunition, and they were uh, they were uh, you know tasked with br bringing back some uh, some food. Uh, and there was a lot of hunting on a scale which was maybe a thousand times uh, higher than what uh, occurred there uh, usually. So my hypothesis, my main hypothesis about this uh, situation is that the uh, HIV was one of the soldiers got infected while hunting a chimpanzee. Eventually, the soldier came back to Leopoldville around 1916. And the soldiers started a chain of transmission in Leopoldville, and not in the uh, not in Cameroon. So uh, basically, uh, a way to summarize it is that I think the the medical cut hunter uh, might indeed have been a, a, a cut soldier. And if chimpanzee zero was Cameroonian, then patient zero might very well have been a Congolese. <laughs> And um, Lucas, do you, do you want to sort of join in on that as well? I think it's, um, I, I think I just want to, to, to quickly express that I, I, I really, really enjoyed the, um, the origin of AIDS, the book. And I think it's, a, it's what, what, I, what I, again, listening to this new aspect or this new element of this, what I find deeply fascinating in the way that you work, Jacques, is, is to, to bring kind of this this history of of the first world war together with the history of uh, uh, um, genetics and the, the the more biological acute history of the the epidemic to create this dense narratives of origin which i i think are really really very um striking yeah i mean it's, it strikes me that both your books are characterized by you know, sort of blending of methodologies from different disciplines. You know, which is, you know, I think what's what's so interesting about both books. Uh, yeah, like Jack's book, it's always sort of detective work on, um, you know, in the sort of quite distant past. You know, um, trying to, sort of, you know, really uncover what's happening. You know, in the First World War, nineteen twenties. Um, I mean, what were some of the challenges of that process then, Jack? Well, the challenges, for example, in this. Um... What I've just described is uh, I wasn't in fact lucky because the um, the um, the story is kind of funny. But at the end of World War One, the French army decided to write up a history of uh, World War One, which which was to be useful for the French military and for the public. But they uh, they worked on this for 20 years, and it was completed uh, in in 1939. So just uh, just a few months before the beginning of World War II, and they uh, they produce uh, 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 something which was 76,000 pages long. So I don't think Michael, you would have 
<laughs> you would have liked that as an editor, but they're 107 volumes, and wow. they, 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 they have three or four volumes on the Camer Cameroonian campaign, which was really a minor event in, in the world. So there was a lot of information there. But I also went to, uh, to Brussels and uh, Paris uh, about a year ago, and I did find some archives, and especially in Paris uh, at the place called Chateau de Vincennes, which is the, the, uh, the, the place for the archives of the French military. And, and there I got written documents, uh, letters from an officer to some other officer or, or report about disciplinary uh, problems. So it was possible to get, it was surprising, but it was po possible to get uh, a lot of information on uh, on all that. But uh, so I managed to piece this together and um, I was a bit lucky, I must say, with the, uh, the way the French documented their uh, expedition there. Hmm. I mean, one of the other um, sort of notable aspects of, um, of the first book in terms of um, your hypothesis around the origins of AIDS was the role of contaminated needles. So um, could you could you say something about the respective contribution of those contaminated injections and um, versus sexual transmission at the kind of stages in the um, spread of HIV AIDS? Yep. So, so basically, the virus arrived in Leopoldville, let's say, around 1916 or maybe 1920. So, so then you, you had one person infected in, in Leopoldville. Leopoldville at that time was a small town with about 14,000 inhabitants. And eventually, uh, there was a slow spread of the virus for three decades. So from one person infected, when you get to the early 1950s, they had something like 500 persons infected at the time. And so, so over a period of more than, say, let's say around 35 years. During that period, of course, the population of Leopoldville increased many fold, so from, from 14,000. Uh, in, in the uh, early 1950s, they had uh, about 200, 225,000 inhabitants. So I believe during that long period, this was probably, to a large extent, very slow sexual transmission. Uh, there was prostitution in the city, but it was a, a kind of a soft prostitution. So they had uh, women, they, they were called free women. And they had three or four regular uh, clients. Each client was visiting them maybe once a week. So that was enough for some spread of the, the virus sexually, but quite slowly. And then beginning in the early 50s, the, that was a bit, around 1952, that was the beginning of a phase of exponential amplification of the virus. So it, it changed completely. And that part in the 1950s, there are several reasons to believe that this was mainly transmission through contaminated injections. So this occurred in several healthcare facilities in Leopoldville, and that included uh, the sexually transmitted disease clinic. And this clinic was an, an important part of the story because the, the people who were treated there with intravenous injections were mostly the free women who were having uh, sex with regularly with three or four men, and so th so there was an amplification through the contaminated injections, but that kind of also spread to, to towards the male clients of these women. And then comes 1960. That's the independence of, of the Congo. Terrible chaos. Uh, huge migrations from people from from the countryside to Leopoldville, which was safer, and massive poverty. And that changed the face of prostitution in, in the city. So from women prostitutes having two or four clients per year, they had now three or four or five per day. So 1,000, 1,500 per year. So that set the stage for, for what was then so for, from the 1960s, it was mainly a sexual transmission. So initially, uh, among the core group of, of sex workers and their clients, that was 
the 1960s and starting in in the uh, at the beginning of the 1970s uh, the, uh, sexual transmission but it many sexual transmission persisted but it was it, it moved out of the core group and now it, it was towards the uh, the general population in 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 Leopoldville and then it increased until the uh, the mid 1980s where it it stabilized so i think the, the the transmission through contamination contaminated injections that was mostly in the 1950s and after that to some extent the uh, the medical officers became aware of the risk of making injections with needles that, and syringes that were merely flush with water but they were also advances in the treatment of a number of infections. So uh, th there was less need to administer intravenous injections. And that's how this mode of transmission eventually uh, faded away. Hmm. Now, if we could turn to the later history of AIDS, uh, Lucas, if I could ask you, um, your work um, very much focused on that later period, and, and in particular, how the pandemic was visualized. Um, so. Yeah, why why should we pay attention to focus on on that particular aspect of the history of AIDS? <clears throat> yeah, um, I think I, I'll 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 stick with the with the um, with the question of of origins because I think that's that's actually a really 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 useful uh, way to think through the history of pandemics and history of epidemics at large. And I think what I was always struck with um, studying the history of AIDS is that, that at different stages of this pandemic, different stories of its origin tended to dominate how the pandemic was perceived and how it was understood. And I think striking just, just listening to, to, to Jacques' voice is, is like it's how new that perspective is that AIDS emerged in the beginning of the 20th century and that it basically was, was unseen for a large part of the 20th century as a disease, as something that people suffered from and died from, you know, until it emerged again, if you, if you want, or until it emerged in the focus, or until it was visualized or became visible in 1981 in the United States, when the CDC reported for the first time, which, I mean, this year, this will be the 40th anniversary of, of the, 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 the um, the, begin the beginning of AIDS, but look, hearing or listening to Jacques' perspective, it's it's somewhat absurd that we still continue to hold on to this idea that it started when it was first seen through a, a, a clinician's eye. And I think that that is something that I find really interesting, and that's prompted me to <coughs> to to develop this 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 book on on different ways of seeing the pandemic. And um, in a way, you can think of that as, 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 as three different periods that from the 80s, more or less to the present structure, how AIDS was perceived and how AIDS and HIV was, was also then understood and how it was treated and how it was engaged with, but also how it was intervened in. And um, mostly for the first decade of the pandemic, it was associated with the population that it first emerged in. And it was gay men in the United States. And then later, this was expanded to to Haitians, to heroin, or other intravenous drug users, and um, hemophiliacs. So uh, um, people suffering from um, blood, uh, what's it called? Um, hemophiliacs is the term. Um, the famous four H, but. It was in that time where also the way to visualize, the way to frame the pandemic, both within medical publications as well as within the public, um, public was predominantly done through photographs. Photographs of the symptoms of Kaposi sarcoma, photographs of the patient population, photographs of the people who were suffering from this pandemic. And so the, the imagined origin of what people would often understood at that time, and for, for, for mostly for worse, not for better, was to, to identify also the, the, the social groups, gay men or Haitians, with the origin of this pandemic. There were lots of speculation about the association between certain practice, sexual practices or uh, the, the, the um, ethnic origin of certain groups to be somewhat implicated in this emergent disease. And it's important to, to recall here that, of course, for the first four or five years, even the virus hypothesis that this is driven by a virus was, was controversial, to say the least. And then 
from that first decade, then I, I look towards the, the early 90s, which was a, a period that, that where, where it dawned that this is indeed not just a disease of the United States. It's not just a disease that occurs in certain isolated popul populations, but it's a much bigger picture, but also a much diverse picture that is, has very different shapes and very different parts of the, of, the, of the world. And that's where maps come in and a geographical view where people started to look at the pattern of distribution that are different in different parts of the world, that transmission is very differently organized in different societies and different cultures, and that one has to di differentiate between these different forms of transmission to better understand what this disease is. But it also is the time where the, where the, where the historical look towards that origin of AIDS in Africa becomes such an important framework to to really decenter the idea that this is a disease of urban, modern, uh, prolific places, but that this is a disease that has a much deeper history towards the points that, that Jacques just flagged up. And then I think the, the, the third decade, decade that I look at in the late 90s up until the 2000s is the time when this, these two previous registers, the photograph of the patient and the map of the, of the, the spread of the disease, become somewhat um, forgotten or move into the background to make space for this new visualization of the virus and that is through the picture of the virus itself. The moment where treatment becomes available, the moment when, when, when the understanding of this microbiological agent takes front of stage, it also becomes the icon through which one perceives this pandemic and it becomes the kind of the enemy against which uh, one is or one organizes the response to this pandemic and it becomes a kind of wholly different pictures of how to perceive this disease. So picking up on some of those points, uh, I wondered, Jacques, in the in the sort of earlier period then, so when um, colonial officials, um, you know, I, I guess, you know, administrators, they're sort of faced with, you know, they, I guess they don't know quite what they're dealing with, but they must be, are they thinking, you know, are, are they trying to map you know the um, the spread of the disease in, in the kind of earlier period in kind of you know much more sort of basic ways. Yes, so, so that was um, that one of the reasons this um, th there was massive spread of the virus through contaminated injections was that they they did have uh, very ambitious uh, public health goals. So they decided to focus on a, on a small number of diseases. Initially, it was a sleeping sickness, and then a disease called Yaws, and which is similar to similar pathogen as, as syphilis. They also concentrated on on syphilis and uh, and a few others, but but their their goal was to eliminate these diseases from either Cameroon or from the Belgian Congo, and to do that, they they went. Uh, to each and every village and they, you know, they they screened the whole population and they would do that every six months and those that had uh, were found to have trypanosoma sleeping sickness or yaws or syphilis they were then treated on the spot with uh, intravenous drugs and usually these drugs had to be given like for 12 10 12 days so that 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 give uh, much of a, an opportunity for HIV to spread. And what happened is that, of course, HIV was unknown at the time. It would take another 50 years be before it was discovered in the States, as, as Lucas just explained, discovered, recognized in the States, I should say. Um, so, so, but but there was also a lot of transmission of, of the hepatitis B and the hepatitis C virus. But most of these cases of hepatitis C, for example, when, when you get acute hepatitis C, it's, you, you know, you, you're a bit sick, you feel unwell for a few days, and there's nothing spectacular that develops. So that, that allowed all, all these other pathogens that, that were transmitted to be just completely uh, missed, completely unseen. And, and eventually starting, what happened is actually in Europe, in uh, uh, 1950s and 1960s, people recognized that viruses were transmitted through injections, and eventually that knowledge uh, trickled down to the the colonies where uh, physicians became more prudent, and that that that's how eventually the, the spread through injections uh, slowed down. 
Hmm. And Lucas, um, but so that those kind of uh, that visualization that you're sort of mapping out in your work. So, um, to what extent is that sort of essential to bringing you know sort of AIDS under control? You know, that as a does that play a really sort of important part? I think there's there's a there's often a tendency to think of visualization as something secondary or something that is that is used to to popularize science or to use to popularize knowledge and to make it available. And I think that is um, not the case. And the the material that I I found also more or less by by luck was was and that I was becoming very fascinated by was the series of eight atlases. And these were these were clinical atlases produced by clinicians and um, and scientists to to collect and to arrange what was at different stages between 1986 and 2008 understood to be the consensual way of looking at AIDS and of seeing and recognizing AIDS. And as you can imagine, in the in the or as maybe not can imagine, but in the in the in the in the 80s, this was mostly a diagnostic tool for clinicians at the bedside. So it was. It was and to, to, to sharpen that understanding that there's an unusual set of symptoms coming together in a patient that might be indicative for an underlying uh, uh, infection with HIV for those symptoms. And important is here, all these symptoms that, that emerged or that, 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 that are caused by HIV or indirectly caused by HIV, they existed before and they were well classified and well understood before. But it was about that particular way of clustering having this usually quite rare skin cancer, Kaposi sarcoma, together with uh, pneumonia, so lung infections and other things and other horrible infections. Um, those coming together in those clusters, that was what, what clinician needed to learn to see and to recognize. And therefore, there was a clinical textbook, if you want, that allowed that. But then it became also important to understand the geography and to see and to understand the geogra ge geographical spread and to understand those areas that are more affected by HIV and AIDS. And, not, and just to stay with the United States for a moment, it remained a disease in the United States that was mostly transmitted from metropolitan, uh, from, 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 metropolitan from, from, from city clusters to city clusters. It didn't sweep mm. over the country like, like, like this like common understanding of a plague that, that kind of like just takes village by village or something. But this was an epidemic that, that distributed through a very specific pattern. And it was important to understand, to allocate one's own sense of risk or to allocate also one's own sense of the likeliness of being confronted as a clinician with, with cases of AIDS or as a patient or as a potential patient, um, to understand how, how one is positioned towards those landscapes of risk. And therefore, these pictures are really important to develop that understanding and to develop those, those kind of better um, approaches to, to addressing this developing and very slowly developing crisis. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, um, you know, our, our listeners, you know, would obviously be thinking about what's happening now, um, you know, like in turn, you know, in um, hearing, you know, what, 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 the, what you've both been saying and, you know, drawing those, drawing those parallels. So I wonder if you could both um, talk about the parallels between AIDS and the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, in terms of whether this is, there are parallels, what are the kind of similarities, differences? Uh, maybe, if, maybe if Jacques starts on that. Yeah, so that's that's an interesting question, but the, 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 I would say there are common grounds and uh, then there are major differences, of course. Common grounds that include, for example, the, there is an animal source. So for HIV, it was the chimpanzee from Central Africa. For COVID-19, it's, it's, it's the bat, and we're not really sure whether the pangolin acted as an intermediary between bats and humans, but it, it comes from an animal source. And you can be sure that future pandemics will be uh, secondary to the, the transfer of, of some animal pathogen to, to human beings. Now, there were also peculiar human behaviors that played a part. So in the case of HIV, it was hunting and eventually prostitution. In the case of COVID-19, again, peculiar animal behaviors. If you look at what, you know, what happened in the, uh, the wet markets, the, the animal markets in China, 
that's very strange behavior for mo to most of us. And that, that played also a, a very central role for, for the emergence of COVID-19. Then at a deeper level, and I, I, I'm not a historian, I, just a doctor, but at deeper levels, there were also societal changes that played a role. So for HIV, it was modern medicine, colonization of Central Africa, and urbanization. So very, uh, you know, without these factors, the, the course of the pandemic would have been much different. And then, of course, for COVID-19, it's the, the international travel. You know, there's something like 100,000 flights that take off and eventually land every day throughout the world, every day of the year. So that that made it possible for this novel virus co uh, causing COVID-19 to spread uh, extremely rapidly. Now, of course, the major difference is the, you know, the incubation period. So for, for HIV, on average, it takes about 10 years before you develop AIDS. Uh, you know, there's some variation, but on average, it's 10 years. And now with COVID-19, it's something like five or six days between the infection and and the the appearance of the symptoms. So obviously, with COVID-19, everything is going in the in the fast-forward mode compared to uh, to a, a HIV/AIDS. And and then because of that, of course, the the disease is recognized early on. You know, with with HIV, it took about 60 years before it was recognized. In the case of COVID-19, it took about about a month for the the Chinese to sort it out. Now, I, I think it's clear that in the future, other such events are going to uh, to happen. I mean, other animal viruses will be uh, will be transmitted to uh, to human beings, and that will start. That will you know trigger an an epidemic and and eventually a pandemic. What? which virus, where it's going to happen, I think it's totally unpredictable. What has changed is also is our technological capacity uh, compared to, you know, to what it was obviously in the, uh, in the colonial Africa and, and even in, in the United States in the 1980s. So the virus was recognized in about one month. Very rapidly, scientists at all the nucleic, nucleic acid sequences of, of, of the, uh, the COVID-19 virus. And then within a year, an effective vaccine was developed. So that's extraordinary. Now, what could be improved? And that, that I think some serious consideration should be given. And I, I'm, I'm going to say something which probably can be controversial. But I think wh whenever there's a there's a new a new pathogen that seems to be emerging into human populations, uh, you know, very much like what happened in China about a year ago. I think we need to 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 consider the the possibility of shutting down some borders for a short for a few months and and try to keep it limited to some extent to where it emerged. And that would buy time, and that would allow scientists to uh, to to develop, you know, a, a novel vaccine. I think, in retrospect, one of the errors in the management of the COVID-19 pandemics was that at the beginning, the usual thinking, you know, from the uh, World Health Organization down to national governments, was that, you know. We need to keep borders open, you know. Borders do not stop viruses and and so on. So that you know that reflected the, uh, the what was the standard uh, philosophy at the time. But I think that that needs to be reconsidered. If it would not have been possible to avoid the spread of the virus out of China and and into so many countries, but if we if we had been able to slow it down a bit you know, to gain maybe two or three months, that would have been very useful. So uh, that's my opinion. Of course, I mean, you know, many people won't agree, but I think that's one of the lessons. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I, I don't have much to add to this. I think one one aspect that I um, 
keep thinking out thinking about a lot is this kind of question of of the, the different time scales uh, at which something like HIV developed and the the time scale uh, um, in which COVID nineteen now has developed uh, over the last year and many of the processes that we can that we could compare between HIV and COVID nineteen first of all need to have this kind of disclaimer that they happen at very different time scales drastically different time scales what last decades in the terms of in the times of AIDS and HIV lasted a couple of months uh, uh, in COVID-19 when you look into how the idea of developing a vaccine to setting up laboratories and research facilities to develop a vaccine and succeeding actually developing a vaccine which in HIV still is not successful although it's a very different virus very different challenges and so on but I think one thing that I want to want to also add to to what Jacques just brought up is 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 one thing that is really that I find really interesting in in both of these pandemics is is what was necessary at what point to develop a sense of crisis so that governments were spurred into action and in in HIV AIDS it's the story of of relentless activism of those who have been affected mostly by the pandemic in the first few years in the 1980s which was an extremely painful chapter in that in that pandemic. There was governmental neglect over years, not assuming that this pandemic needs any further attention or any kind of mentioning even in public. The Reagan administration famously never spoke about AIDS until 1986. Five years into this pandemic, it was not mentioned by the administration as, a, as something that needs to be uh, um, um, considered. Obviously, we have a very different situation with COVID-19, and one might ask somewhat diabolically if that is because it affects everyone so obviously large parts of the societies, although it still affects some parts of societies considerably worse, older generation, those who are clinically uh, vulnerable. Um, but still, it is a, it's a pandemic that has, a, has very quickly in comparison, developed a kind of sense of crisis that needs to be uh, um, reacted to. But if we listen to Jacques, and I think he's absolutely right there, it was still not fast enough. And still the voices of, of, of uh, those who were, A, working on, on, on pandemic preparedness for the last decade or so, were not listened to at crucial moments. And those who very early on uh, raised the alarm about this pandemic were again not listened to. And I think we need, as societies, consider both of these epidemics as examples of understanding how we want to establish infrastructures in which we establish an expertise that policy is willing to listen to in those kind of times to, to, to react before it is too late. Because I feel that is, that is one of the elements that we can see in those, both of these pandemics to be a recurrent, and in other pandemics too, a recurrent factor, that warnings are not heeded and then reactions are put in place when the fallout is so much greater than it could have been if early voices would have been heard. If, if I can add something to what Lucas just said, it's that in the case of COVID-19, there had been a, a, well, a very serious warning, which was the, uh, the disease that broke out in China in 2003-2004, uh, which was called SARS. Yeah. And SARS, it was, a different uh, a different type of cor coronavirus but it 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 emerged in a, in a animal market somewhere in, in in China and from also from bats but through a different uh, animal an intermediary animal called the uh, civet civet I don't know how you, how you say in English uh, and that was recognized early on and the Chinese they closed down these, this market and, and all animal markets in throughout China. But as uh, SARS was much less serious, the, uh, a few, maybe five, 6,000 people got infected in, in about 25 countries. But as soon as, as it came to an end, the, the Chinese authorities reopened the animal markets. And if you've seen images of of these markets is just incredible. I mean, you have maybe 100, 200 different animal species who are packed on top of each other. They're still alive there, and the clients go there, and you know they they walk around and they you know they buy this 
this animal and, and the animal is is killed and slaughtered you know in front of you and so, so so that creates an incredible opportunity for spread of various animal viruses to humans but in in this case there had been a warning and 14 15 years ago and it was ignored by the uh, the chinese authorities so that's that's a very also uh, a very sad part of that of that story you know it, it could have been avoided to some extent mm -hmm. and um, so looking back to you know the work that you've done Jack, so what were the kind of missed moments in terms of containing hiv then in terms of it's you know so it's obviously got a much longer trajectory than you know what we're looking at over the last 12 months you know so in t you know in terms of you know could the french colonial government have intervened you know sort of differently and contained canada at a, at a much earlier stage I, I don't think so i think it would have been for, for first it would have been it was completely impossible for them to recognize this uh, emerging virus, emerging disease. So there was nothing, they could, I mean, sure, they, they should have been more prudent with with their injections, but, you know, people didn't, didn't understand the risk at the time. I think the, from my point of view, the and then it went, you know, it spread within Africa and from there to Haiti and from Haiti to the US. But in Africa, the, the missed opportunity was starting in the late 80s and the, into the 1990s and even after 2000. And there was a lack of uh, a systematic effort to control the infection among sex workers. There were several, many research projects organized around sex workers. You know, they, they, they're easy to find, they want to collaborate and so on. But but the it was never at the level of the, of, of the World Health Organization and eventually UNAIDS. It was never a, a kind of a global program to control, you know, HIV and STDs among sex workers throughout the continent. And at at that part of the development of the pandemic, they really played a, a central role. And to control STDs and HIV among them, it's it's very easy. Just provide them with very good supplies of free condoms and field workers who are there to help them and organize you know the the, the delivery of these condoms so that that was really a, a terrible opportunity that was missed and the one country that did it it's thailand and you know they, they came up with what they call the 100 percent condom policy and this was imposed with uh you know, severe measures for, for those who in the sex work industry who didn't uh, respect that. And, and they managed to control HIV in, in Thailand in a very effective way and quite rapidly just through that simple intervention. So that was certainly a, a terrible opportunity that was missed in, in Africa and, and in other countries as well. Mm -hmm. And Lucas, I was going to ask you, so, so over the last year, we've clearly seen a, a very rich um, visualization, you know, like, you know, because, it, you know, in terms of COVID. So how, how does that, you know, for, for you who, you know, studied so much the kind of visualization of AIDS, how, how have you kind of looked on to, you know, kind of the way in which, you know, um, COVID has been sort of visualized since it's emerged? I mean, there's, there's, there's again, I think the, 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 the question of origin and how the origin of of, of COVID-19 is visualized is, is absolutely essential here. And and one one motive that 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 came out very early on was of course the the the, the bad market, as Jacques mentioned multiple times, as one place of origin that that also I think in the in the Western perspective became quite a quite a quite a um quite a mythical point of of imagination also for 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 something that I think is that also is important to think of as 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 a very um, um, or as as an infrastructure that also replaces the lack of a cool chain you know, in in certain communities, and then replace then sustains the safest way of way of of uh, um, supplying a food chain to some extent. But it is also, I think the the the, the visualizations of COVID nineteen were very different to HIV in in many multiple ways. I think we've 
I, I was struck that that only now in the in the second wave with these new newly spiraling number of death of mortality rates in, in, in the UK, the uh, um, media reporting has started to put patients into the focus. People dying in ICU are being suddenly portrayed almost as if they suddenly emerge as the people that might might bring everyone else, might shock everyone else into the kind of discipline that is required to sustain this lockdown. I'm not quite sure what their thinking is, but certainly BBC reporting has started to, to put the camera into the ICU quite a lot, uh, which wasn't the case in the beginning of the pandemic. I thought it was quite remarkable that through the large part of this pandemic, those who suffered from it were, were, were largely invisible and were largely kind of like not shown to the public space, were not largely not shown, but we saw fantastic images of the virus itself. And those, those uh, images with the spikes were, were the one thing that everybody could agree on that this is what we need to kind of assemble around as the common enemy that needs to be found and developed. And so there are these, these questions of origin again that, that are often very much framed through the visual framework. And one is the, the question of, of the geographical origin, China, the wet market. And the other one is this question of the, the virus itself that originates in, in all of us or through all of us, but uh, uh, is the, 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 the real cause of this problem. And yeah, so it's always sort of visualization as a tool of state control. You know, it's, um, you yeah. know, I think you're sort of saying that. You, you could have said visualization is a form of containment. You, you frame the epidemic, you frame what it means, you frame what it, how it's supposed to be understood, you frame how it's supposed to be acted upon. And that, that is very well done through visualization. And also visualizations, of course, are very well attuned to the kind of anxieties that people have around epidemics and how, the kind of anxieties that emerge from. Another, another powerful repertoire of images that is, I think, quite typical for this pandemic was, of course, also the empty street and the empty public space as one that, that, that became the remarkable representation of, of containment here. Uh, and also a, a, a plea to, to, again, to discipline and to maintaining mm -hmm. kind of safety. Oh, but, uh, sort of this is, this is very much an ongoing history. <laughs> but then it's very interesting. I was thinking of sort of Chinese residents barricaded in their homes in the kind of early stages, you know, sort of actually being forcefully contained um, yeah. as well. Yeah. I mean, well, it, well, certainly one of the images that I will remember is the uh, the coffins, for example, I remember that in Italy uh, in, during the first wave, there were uh, photographs of, uh, you know, 100 or 200 coffins with with dead people in in it and accumulated somewhere near a hospital. And the, you know, the army trucks would would take them and and eventually, uh, you know, bury them. So that's uh, that, that's one strong image that I will remember for long. But I, I also agree with Lucas, the empty cities. I mean, for example, China, Wuhan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's how they did it. You know, no that, that's how they managed to control it. Nobody on the street. Whereas in in North America and Europe, even with the lockdown, you know, it, it was not as empty as in China. Mm -hmm. We got a couple of audience questions now. Um, I think this one's for Jacques. Uh, I wonder if you could say something about the role of tourism travel in the spread of AIDS in the uh, 50s and 60s. Yeah, well, the, 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 the main part of the story, which is which is related to this specific question, is uh, is uh, what happened in in Haiti and and between Haiti and the United States. So so we know for for sure that the the virus moved out of Africa um, around 1967, 1968. It, it got to Haiti and, uh, and that was through one of the uh, technical assistants. Uh, there was something like four or 5,000 Haitians that came to work in the Congo, a newly independent state because of the, uh, you know, the, the difficulties that, that they had there. So one of them brought it back to Haiti around 1967-68. And at this time, Haiti was developing as a, a popular destination for sexual tourism. And 
including among the uh, the, the, the gay men uh, from, from the United States. So they went there for a week or two. They had sex with uh, Asian males prostitute, and eventually at least one of them got infected and brought it back to uh, to New York. Actually, oh, just three or four years after it it arrived in uh, in 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 Haiti. Uh, and then, as Lucas explained, it, from from major city of New York, it, it it went to San Francisco and and LA, and that was also through uh, the travel of, of of gay men between between these cities. And and some of them, some of these travels, of course, were for uh, for another kind of of sexual tourism. So yes, it did it did play a role uh, before uh, before that. When, when the disease was was in limited to Africa, a number of, of, of European got infected with sex workers there, but that, these these eventually became dead end infections. So the the Belgian man infected his Belgian wife, and that was the end of it. So it didn't play much of a role then. Mm -hmm. And we got uh, another question um, for you, Jack. Um, back in the time of the um, AIDS emergence. How much of the slow response can, in hindsight, be accounted for AIDS being predominantly in a minority, perhaps an unwanted group, uh, rather than it, um, so that it was a relatively limited group of people catching it? Um, I mean, for me or for Lucas? Oh, yeah, no, well, I, I guess. I, yeah. Well, okay. well, I guess actually it could be for Lucas, couldn't it? Well, I mean, it, it connects, yes. It, well, Lucas, because it does connect to that point you were making earlier, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's a it's a crucial aspect of that history is 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 that, and I think there's an old trope, an old kind of uh, um, idea in the history of medicine that you also find in the history of syphilis or in the history of other. It's, it's that instead of the deserving, the deserving. Um, or the deserving victim and that is that is something that is that is been used a lot in that initial few years of of the emergence of AIDS which had a lot to do with on the one hand the 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 uncertainty around the causal mechanism behind this disease it was very much a mysterious uh, condition that that emerged and many of the initial research that was carried out on this disease which just as a reminder, was initially called uh, um, GRITS, gay-related immune deficiency syndrome. So it was in its in its in its naming uh, directly associated with gay men as a, as a population. But um, that was very quickly then dropped when it was emerged that the same patterns of infections, the same patterns of 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 uh, um, skin cancer and pneumonia also emerge in other groups that are not directly associated with gay gay men. And there's a lot of uncertainty remaining until today. I mean, Jacques just portrayed these kind of initial pathways in the in the United States. And I think one big question mark that is still there is is, is the transmission of the disease in in in, in um, intravenous drug takers in the in the early 80s and 80s. And there's a lot of indicative evidence that this might have been a very, very significant group as well that has transmitted the virus well. Needle sharing was very common. In that time, at that time, it was also highly stigmatized, and at the same time, it's also a group that is, has a, has traditionally a huge distance to any kind of medical institution. So there's very, very little data remaining to reconstruct those kind of pathways, whereas the kind of uh, uh, pathways and 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 information that is available about gay communities is still something that can be scoured through. But I think. To come back to the question, it's it's a feature of almost any epidemic and almost any pandemic in history that there seems to be an inherent reflex reflex of associating the pandemic with those that carry it, and that association with those that carry it of almost always is the wrong move because it implies a kind of safety for the rest of the world that often translate to a not having to take care of it or not having to take notice of it, and therefore often allowing a disease to become so much worse than it ever was. And I think that that kind of thinking, that kind of attributing and identifying an epidemic with a specific population or a specific marginalized group is one that one should always be extremely attentive against because it's almost always wrong. Mm 
I can add something also the w w one thing which is uh, which is common also to HIV and and to some extent to COVID but uh, many other uh, pandemics was to, uh, actually to blame foreigners and uh, you know syphilis in the uh, end of the middle age or you know 19 you know 1500 or 1600 it was it was described as the napolitan disease you know the disease that you you caught in naples and in the us you know of course initially it was among the gay men and the uh, iv drug users but when the Asians were in were identified quite early on as a, as another risk group that allowed the americans to blame other people and the, you know for a number of years they blame Asians for having brought this this terrible disease to the united states and they were all kind of wild theories about you know how it had spread in, within haiti uh, voodoo practices uh, bestialism uh, and, and and so on and, and then the Asians, because of that developed a, a very strong uh, reaction against this uh, discrimination from the from the united states so but but their reaction was in response to the the fact that they had been blamed for what happened there and so eventually now we, we we of course we found out that AT was not really the source it was just like a stepping stone towards the united states and then it comes from 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 central africa but uh, up to that day, Asians remain extremely uh, sensitive to this issue, and they, you know, they they still very strongly believe that the virus went the other way around from the U.S. towards Haiti, which which is probably not the case. And I I, I saw that there was a question about the Congo. Well, uh, people in the Congo, I think in general they they know they they know very little about about that about the fact that the you know the it all started in leopoldville but i was there uh, maybe seven or eight years ago and i i gave a talk to a group of uh, congolese doctors and they, they didn't have this uh, strong reaction against the you know the the ideas in my talk as i would have when i present in montreal and when when you have some people from from Haiti in the in the audience, so the, the Congolese, well, the small number that I, you know, discuss this with the, you know, that's part of history. That's it. That's what happened. And actually, when when you look at the story, it was you know a produce of uh, of colonialism. So if you know, maybe the Belgians and and the French would be the ones that should be blamed. Mm -hmm. no, I'm afraid the the hour, the hour um, is fast approaching, and so uh, I'm going to have to wrap things up at this point. So uh, I'd like to thank everyone for for their questions. I'm really sorry for the um, small number of questions that we weren't able to quite get to within the hour. Um, uh, can I please thank Lucas and Jack for a really fascinating talk, those insights into their work. Um, I'm sure people are going to want to kind of follow up and read further about that. And thank you very much to all of you in the audience who joined us today. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.